everyone. Welcome to another episode of Fans in Motion, the uh, the Night Ranger podcast that you wanted and need or whatever Andy's little spiel is. We are here. You got Josh, you got Brent, but we are minus Andy. No Andy, no problem, right? That's not a problem at all, but what you forgot was you've got to recite some kind of lyric that goes along with this episode as he looks into the camera and oh, does this. Yeah, I didn't do that. Uh, yeah, you didn't um, do that. Uh, uh, I don't know. Uh, I'm so, do you do I, feel like we do? I'm so far gone that I can't uh, go on whatever. Uh, yeah, I, I, I'm sorry. I don't have the uh, lyric ready to go, but uh, I have failed you, Andy. So this episode is part two of the Gary Moon interview we're going to have parts one two and three so we this is the second middle part um we moon them once we moon them twice we're gonna moon them a third third time there you go um this this episode covers the rest of his time in night ranger uh we talk about his tenure in night ranger coming to an end and we get into a little bit of his solo career afterwards. And we talk about the Alligator album, the Brad Gillis solo album in the early 2000s that he was on. And a little bit of the Kelly Kagi time passes. I think we get to it in this uh, interview as well. So the last episode, obviously part one, we covered the beginning of his career all the way up to getting into Night Ranger. Um, leading up to that, there were some great stories about Three Dog Night and Matt Sorum living in his studio. And um, we had a lot of, gr- lot of great feedback from that. Uh, a lot of, uh, many familiar stories that kind of mirror ours. Is There's a lot of Night Ranger fans who went and saw that era of the band. I did. Um, and... I think thoroughly enjoyed it. It was probably one of the first times. Here's what I think probably happened was, and it kind of mirrors probably what you and Andy did, but I don't think most people probably weren't as dedicated as you, but they were fans. Midnight Madness, Seven Wishes, maybe a little bit in the big life. And then, you know, they start becoming a little bit older. Some stuff hits, you know, college. And and once that kind of dies down, I think a lot of them went, you know, hey, Night Ranger's playing the, at this rock club and they get to go see him. And it was the first time that they were ever really able to get kind of one on one with the band. Because unless you saw them on that small Midnight Man in Motion tour, they were always playing these arenas and stuff like mm-hmm. that. So I think that's another thing that we a lot of people have in common is the first time they were able to get real close and actually meet Brad and Kelly were at these shows. Unless you went to the hotels and stalked them like we did when we were kids, you know. Well, that takes dedication, and uh, yeah, not everybody was that dedicated. Now I think, and I think it's the same with you guys is they were pretty accessible during the Man in Motion tour, but. They were kind of off the, you know, really off the radar by that point. So. I'll tell you, I'll tell you how accessible they were. It was January, and we were outside of Bogarts in the back, and they met everybody that was back there. Mm-hmm. You know, that's how accessible they were, and there were a lot of people back there. Yeah, well, I mean, even though they were playing Bogarts, uh, it was, you know, you're still not too very far removed from. When they were at the height of power during uh, Seven Wishes. So what do we got in the uh, Night Ranger world of news? I always have to cover my ear. In Night Ranger news, it's not much, but I felt it was important to share. (laughs) Our friend of the show, Eric Levy, is working with the National Kidney Foundation. And he's wanting you to go to his page and you can check it out. They're, he's doing a holiday auction for the National Kidney Foundation to help, and he says that 37 million Americans are affected by kidney failure. And it, I think it'd be a great thing 
if you want to reach out, it's, it's the giving time of year to um, help Eric with this crusade. Yeah, and the, currently it's a Zoom chat, so and Zoom is really easy to use. All you got to do is download it, and yep, the bidding is up to two hundred and twenty-five. Is that what it is now? Right now, yeah, I just pulled it up, and uh, it's a twenty to thirty-minute Zoom chat. So yeah, I mean, what's great about that um, is, and we've actually we've had Eric on the show a couple times and done some other work with him and he's great. He's fun to talk to. Mm -hmm. It's great hearing those night ranger tracks, you know, hearing him play the keyboards and isolated. So it's, if you bid on it and you win, you're not going to be disappointed whatsoever. Yeah. It's your Um, time. Yeah. And plus you're helping out a good cause. So uh, if you are interested in doing that, Go to Eric Levy's Facebook page. That's where I got to it. But uh, go to, um, it looks like the website is is e.givesmart.com. And then if you go there, there's probably an events page and find it. Uh, But probably the easiest way is just go to Eric Levy's Levy's Facebook page. And he posted it on December 10th. Yeah, and it looks just like this. It's a video of him talking, and there's a link underneath of it. And I apologize. I um, failed to write down the link. Yeah, like I said, that's that was just me glancing at it real quick. But just go to his Facebook page. And also, he has an Instagram page where he is teamed up with something, some other company, which we'll discuss later. But uh, uh, they are running a contest where you get, like, a free – it's kind of like Cameo. So go to his Instagram page as well. I think that's Eric Levy Music. On Instagram. What else we got there, Brent Tree? That's all we got for Night Ranger news that I have. All right. The, but uh, you have. Go ahead. I don't know if I got any. I'll throw that under the fans in motion stuff. Uh, so new stuff. I know you said you were waiting on some stuff and haven't gotten it in. Yeah, I, I was supposed to be here today. I have... A LP from a band called Witness. Do you remember Witness from back in the day? I remember the uh, movie Witness with Harrison Ford. Yes, one of my favorite movies that um, take place in Amish country. Um, but uh, that is the Amish movie, right? Yes, it was. All right. Um, Where that little boy sees a murder. <clears throat> Who knew Harrison Ford could look so Amish? He's so cool. And so Witness was a band that had Damon Johnson, Brother Kane, and eventually was the was a uh, joined Damn Yankees for their third album. But this came out in I think 1988. Let me double check here. We're just going to say 1980, 1988. Yes, 1988. Couple Night Ranger connections. Um, Kevin Elson, who produced Big Life, produced this record. Mm-hmm. And um, Neil Sean actually co-wrote a few of these tracks. Michael Bolton and Martin Briley uh, co-wrote a track here. But the reason why I got it is that Brad Gillis is on this album. That's cool. So something I was just able to pick up wasn't that expensive. But if you look... Right there, you'll see the Brad Gillis, courtesy of Camel Records. Yep. And it's a promo copy, so two birds, one stone. <laughs> um, so what Fans in Motion news do you got? Fans in Motion news. We have your good friend, Ed Hochstatter. Hochstatter. He um, was sharing, he, it was yesterday. Yesterday was, what, what was the date, the 12th? Uh, December 12th? Correct, I don't know. I believe it was yesterday that was the anniversary of his concert, which was the t- um, 25th anniversary of your Gary Moon concert, I believe, as well. That was his 35th anniversary. Mine was the 25th, yeah. 25th, yeah. So <laughs> he posted a good little um, Seven Wishes collage of all the stuff i thought that was pretty cool 
Their and height it's funny, of power, man. Their height of power. I was working in my garage again yesterday, and I uncovered another box. And in that box is a white sweatshirt with that Night Ranger logo on it. And it's tiny. <laughs> you know, I, I mean, God, it, it was I, it was like three humans of me ago when I weighed a buck oh five and I was just a bean, man. But I have it still. It looks great. No stains. <laughs> I always hate the people that can still fit in their original, you know, it's like, uh, you know, I... back in 1995, 96, when I first started working where I am now, you know, on Halloween, I came as 80s guy and I had leather pants and I could still fit into them. And it was, you know, I mean, I was only 1987s when I graduated. But still, I could still fit in those leather pants, and everybody was calling me lover boy all day long. So I kept walking around with my fingers crossed over my butt. <laughs> Today, I get fired for doing that. <coughs> but yeah, and I had, and I had um, in that when you closed your eyes video, mm -hmm. that gray suede shirt that Kelly Kagi has. Mm -hmm. I had that same shirt. They sold it at Chess King, so I, I wore that, and you know, I, I was rocking. I was styling. Sounds like Night Ranger. Did Nobody was dreaming about me though. Sounds like Night Ranger did a lot of shopping at Chess King. Chess King, yeah. So. Yeah, Chess King definitely sold that shirt. And we've got our good friend, Norio Oya, from the Land of the Rising Sun with some, what is that, Hagen dazs Yeah, it says Dawn of Madness. Uh, yeah. I, yeah, I mean, I don't know. I'm like, at first I'm thinking, well, is that... Is this just some Photoshop stuff? Is it not? Uh, I guess well, the, the Japanese uh, fans would have to let us uh, let us know if that is. Uh... They do special things for people they like. Now you remember that Kiss food that would look like a black charcoal so, so what, brick. What, so what? Night Ranger doesn't like America? No, 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 no. I'm talking about Japan liking the bands that come over, and they made that special Kiss food. That you've been into is like a biscuit with the, all that sauce and pasta in it. It looked gross as shit, but it, it was pretty cool. It had the Kiss logo on it when you opened it up. And this is, um, I don't know. I, I, I can't think of a good a now, or a good pun. Well, even if it is Photoshopped, I mean, they did a good job at it. I mean, it's got, the, it's got different color logos on the side and... Uh, I th I don't know what's on the side. It looks like a snare drum on the left hand side. Yeah, Maybe, I can't tell from here. I think it's an American flag on the right hand side. I mean, th this is me not being able to really tell. But anyways, if you're listening to this, what we're looking at is there's some uh, Hagen Dazs ice cream from Japan. It looks like it's an ad or something. But uh, yeah, if you are uh, if you have one of those, post it to the page. <clears throat> yeah, it, it might have been something that they was proposed. This might just be a mock-up for when, when they came over there. What was that, a year ago now when they did this? When they, yeah, they, I, yeah, I, I, I don't believe know. it was. I just, I mean, it's probably safe to say, yeah, last year because they're there like every 11 yeah. months. So. And um, <laughs> so this might have been a mock-up of something that was going to be proposed to do. In any event, it's very cool. I haven't seen it pop up anywhere but on our page, and that was just this week. So, so Norio. Good job, Don't Norio. Go. Amigato, thank you very much. That's very cool. What else we got? What else we got? That's all I have for Fans of Motion News. What do you have, Josh? Well, we did have a Jewel Hoekstra birthday. So yes, we did. Happy 50th to Jewel Hoekstra. And, uh, um, he's got a new album coming out. He's released a couple other tracks from that record. Go to his page, find it, listen to it. It's all good stuff. Um, and I'm older than he is. Thanks a lot. Uh, we mentioned it earlier when we talked about Ed uh, uh, Ed stuff on the yeah. that he had posted. It's my twenty. What was it? Last night was the twenty fifth anniversary. Twenty fifth. So that would have been December thirteenth that I saw Night Ranger. Um, December thirteenth. 1995 at the Al Rosa Villa. It was a date I think they added on on an off day towards the end of the tour just to you know get more money in. 
uh, because it, if you look at the ticket stub I posted on our Facebook page, I bought that December 8th and the ticket. And I remember it being announced maybe the day before that I bought the ticket. So probably what was happening was that was an off day at the last minute. Yep. They they throw a date on there, put it on sale. Um, now, do you recall where they were before the show or after the show with I, cities? Well, I can tell you, you. I can tell you after the show. Um, before the show, I cannot. Uh, it, again, it's 1995. There's no internet, so. Right. But because I didn't, I didn't know about the show. It could have been in Cincinnati. I may not even known about it then, but I did not know anything previous to that. Um, I remember I heard it on the radio, and if I remember correctly, I remember exactly where I was at in Lancaster as well. Heard it on the radio. Was, uh, if you're from Columbus or around there, you had the Rock and Roll Reverend at the Al Rosa Villa, and he would do these legendary commercials. Night Ranger, December 13th, I got the tickets. It ended up being a snowstorm that day, so not only was it a short turnaround for tickets going on sale, but then there was a you know kind of out-of-the-blue snowstorm that day. So... Mm-hmm. Um, but Al Rosa Villa obviously now is more known for the venue where Dimebag Daryl was murdered um, in 2004. But, uh, yeah, I saw them there that night. Uh, it was, you know, Brad, Kelly, and Gary Moon. They still had David Zychek playing additional guitars and keyboards with them met him after the show everything was good they told me the next the next night (coughs) they were playing in akron at a rock club called ramones and they told me and i didn't know that until they they told me and they said that they would put me on the uh the guest list so we drove, we, I actually went back to my buddy's house that next morning or after that show. And I was talking to a couple of my friends. I'm like, yeah, they said they put us on the guest list if you guys want to go. And they're like, sure. And we were, you know, young and crazy. And we left that. So after the Night Ranger show, I meet my friends. We left like in the middle of the night, like 3 a.m. And <laughs> we decided to drive to Pittsburgh and just go see Pittsburgh. They had never been there. I had. And we went around Pittsburgh, and then late in the you know afternoon, we so the roads were cleared by then, I guess. Well, it was on Inter- Interstate seventy, so they yeah. were there. They weren't. They were okay, but we saw a postal truck, semi truck, off the road, and it crashed, and there was mail everywhere. Really. So, but we were young and dumb, so we still did it. Yeah. So. I would say no, the roads weren't perfect, but we were on, you know, interstate. So we went to Pittsburgh. Then we eventually, you know, leave Pittsburgh in the early afternoon. We drive to uh, Akron. We find this club, and it's still early, maybe 1 o'clock or so, 2 o'clock. Now, at this point, it is snowing really bad. And we've got, we're in a 79 Mercury Zephyr, and... We've got the heat going and everything, and the windows are frosted over. And um, I think I had went up to the club and told the road manager that, hey, they said we'd be put on the guest list. And I think he, you know, took care of that. So we're sitting in the car. We don't know where to go. We got the engine running. The next thing I know, I'm in the passenger seat, and there's a knock on the window. And I roll it down, and it's Kelly Kagey. And he's in this black trench coat. And he's got three all-access passes, and he gives them to us. And I, mean, I don't remember what was said. You know, obviously we thanked him, but it was kind of like this surreal moment that because I couldn't see out yep. the passenger window because it was all frosted over. I just hear a knock, and I roll it down, and there's Kelly Kagey giving us these all-access passes. And uh, but yeah, we saw them that night at Ramones, and then the next night they were going to play in Connecticut which is a good little probably eight-hour drive. We were thinking about doing that. And they actually, I, one of them, I think, Kelly, kind of talked us out of it because, <laughs> you know, he's like, the roads are bad. We were, we were to have, you know, they're in a bus and, and stuff. So, But what they did was 
it was close to the tour ending and they were going to come, you know, have to drive back. So they scheduled a concert at, at the same club the night after the Connecticut night. So they were playing Akron, going to Connecticut, playing Connecticut. And then on the way back, they were going to play the same club in Akron. So we went up two nights later and saw them at the same, same club. The one interesting thing about this time is I, I, I don't know exactly if it's, I got pictures out to look, but the Al Rosa Villa show, Kelly Kagi's drum was, you know, he was facing sideways, you know, at the angle, but yeah. the, but the drum kit was center stage was not on the side. And I do have some photos and they'll probably be up by the time you see this. It was kind of like that when I had seen them too, because it was, it was a small stage, but he was sideways. He was still sideways. When I saw him this, that same summer with, you know, you, in the summer earlier of 95, I saw him three or four times. He was still facing sideways, but the drum kit was still on, you know, our right side of the right. stage. This time his, his drum kit was sideways, but it was in the center, kind of, you know, in the back, you know, behind. So where Gary and Brad could actually walk in front of him. Um, but, yeah, that's just one of those cool little stories I figured this is probably the best time to tell it where just surreal, you know, a knock on the window and there's, uh, you know, Kelly Kagi with all access passes. And my buddy, who was with me, his brother was probably like your age. So he was Thank all you. he was, you know, well, he was there, you know, when seven wishes was huge. Right. And Ed's my friend Ed's my age so we it was a little bit past our time and ed had that all access pass hanging in his bedroom you know at a later date and uh his brother came in and said where did you get that and ed not thinking anything about it was like all oh, the drummer came over and gave that to us and his brother's like bullshit you know get out of <laughs> here he's like no he came over to the car and knocked on our window, and his brother was just flabbergasted, like he didn't really believe him that that happened. But um, just one of those good stories, and that's the fun stuff about being a Night Ranger fan and being able to, especially during that time period and a little bit of the time period after, before the meet and greets really started, where you could interact with them. And I'm sure yeah. a lot of us have stories very similar to mine. So, yeah, it's just a good story I wanted to throw in there. Um, as for any fans in motion stuff else I had, um, I don't know. Everybody likes those Night Ranger ornaments that uh, Crystal Litz um, posted mm-hmm. uh, a week ago. So, Night Ranger, you may want to um, get, yeah, make a note. Get those, uh, get those back it's... back in the uh, catalog there. Yeah, but for next year at this point. And uh, some other stuff, I've been posting some Mojo era photos. The earlier ones from Miami are photos I actually bought from a photographer. Okay, I was going to ask you that. And uh, the ones from the Al Rosa and Ramones are ones that I have taken. So um, any new music that you've been listening to? There's nothing. I haven't had anything new that I've really been listening to, but I did throw this back in. Rock and Roll Bride by Jack Blades, just giving it, you know, some more spins. Um, it's weird, as much as I like Jack, his solo albums are maybe the ones I listen to least. But uh, I like That's a the, good one, too. I like this one better than I do the first one. Um, I think I can say say that. And, uh, and I'm glad that they took somewhere in California... Uh, um, or a grown yeah. up in California off that and made it a Night Ranger track. So with that, you got anything else till we hit we jump into part two yeah. of Gary Moon? Just gonna say Rise and Shine on that C D is fantastic. Uh, yeah, I mean uh Rise and Shine just there's, I, there's a lot of good tracks on that. Yeah. There's not a bad song on the album. No, and especially if you're a Night Ranger fan, you're going yeah. to enjoy it. I mean I like the hardest word to say it was a good ballad and um and they, and he's got some unique stuff that maybe wouldn't fit night range like West Hollywood. I mean, mm-hmm. even though I could see West Hollywood on seven, you know, seven's always been a kind yeah. of a diverse album. So, but uh good stuff. If you haven't 
checked it out. Number one, where the hell have you been? But go find Jack Blade's Rock and Roll Ride. Came out in 2012. So you got anything before we jump into uh, part two? Everybody go to the YouTube page. Subscribe. Hey, we, your, we hit 100 what? subscribers. 100 subscribers. Uh, I didn't make anything for it. <laughs> well, it's not a big milestone, but yeah. it's triple digits, man. Actually, we're gonna, we, I'll, I'll save all that for when we close out the next part. All right. Um, all right. But, yeah, uh, enjoy Gary Moon uh, part two. Uh. Changes, they had to come my way. Just to open my eyes for things that happen anyway. Now, you guys start recording this album, if I'm correct, in Austin, Texas, the Mojo album. That's right. Why Austin, Texas? Is that where Drive was based out of? Um, no. Just who, where, how did you end up in Austin? Well, first of all, David Prater, who's a producer and has produced a couple big records, um, they wanted him, he was, he was open and free to do something with us. He heard the songs that we've recorded so far. Uh, demos and things and um and he's from there okay so, so in order to do it and and with his contacts and studios and all that kind of stuff and we we were in uh, uh a couple great studios out there and that's where we got the sounds and everything so we just you know sometimes when you're doing a record i, I, I found that you get away from home further away from home you can get the better the record's going to be because you're not influenced by you know my yeah, paper right. boy, or my <laughs> dog, you know, something like that. Uh, but uh, yeah, so we thought, and it's, you know, Austin, Texas is, is a great music town. I mean, every time we were done rehearsing, getting ready to go in the studio the next day, we would go down, I think it was 6th Street in Austin, Texas, where all these blues bars are. That's where all of some of those great blues players mm -hmm. got their start. So it was a good influence on us to you know get in a, a nice space so that's what that's why we did it now the was Dave, now the i was gonna say it was david prater is the one that got us out to austin out, and he had worked with dream theater and i think firehouse was two uh, two that's of right. the bands that he had produced and then um if you listen to our glenn burtnick episode he also helped produce uh glenn's 87 album so it's a small world now, I saw you guys in 1993. Uh, you guys played Columbus, Ohio. It was There's a radio station here in Columbus, Ohio called The Blitz, and it was their first ever Blitz Bash held at the Al Rosa Villa. It was outside. Um, <laughs> a whole bunch of local bands during the day. Uh, trying to think. Uh, there was an ACDC tribute group on the uh, bill as well. And then you riff guys. Riff Raff. Riff Raff. You yep. guys, and then you, and then you guys close the show, um, and it, it was great because it's '93. It's the height of grunge, and there is a few thousand people in this parking lot, you know, to see Night Ranger. Um, you guys were a three piece then. Then when I see you guys in '95, you're a four piece. Uh, you guys had a guitarist with you named David Zychek. Um, right. So he's a very close friend. Very close friend with uh, David Prater, and he's like, he's been a tool for David for a long time. Mm -hmm. And, and he, uh, was he from Texas? Is that where their connection? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And then he, now he just basically joined you guys on the '95 tour to just supplement the sound a little bit. Yeah. Okay. '95 tour. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> So I gotta use my props. You, know? <laughs> you guys are you guys are money. Well, <laughs> here, uh, the, uh, why you, you got know what G? Here, this thing's seen its better days. I don't know if you can see that or not. Where am I? That. Oh, a I mojo. Got one of those I, I held on to one of those. I still have one. Um, but um, but uh, we're uh, if you're if you're not watching a video, uh, Brent was yeah. was holding up a, a '95 tour shirt, and I had a mojo hat. So one story I've always liked, um, Gary, is uh, 
And for those, you know, when we talk, when I, when I say stuff like this, me and Gary, Gary's been my Facebook friend for 10, 11 years, and it never failed where if I went overseas, Afghanistan, Liberia, or whatever, I would always get a message from Gary, you know, wishing me, you know, good luck and, you know, stay safe yeah. and all that stuff. And it was always cool, but, and I appreciate that. And within the last couple of years, we have talked more about, though, his, you know, Gary's career in Night Ranger, and he's always been cool and open to me with that. But you told me a story once, and I love the story. So you guys are almost done with the album. You're recording in Austin, and your wife gave you a gift. And tell, talk about the gift and getting on the airplane and all that stuff. You know what I'm talking about, Gary? Well, I'll never forget it because that's where Mojo came from. Um, uh, we, we were recording and it got up to uh, Christmas and we decided, all decided, well, let's take a break for Christmas and come back. I think it was maybe a, it was a week or two weeks uh, break. And, and, and I got a little bit of Indian blood in me because um, way, way back in the blood bank, but um, I was always interested in, uh, you know, Southwest stuff and, and magic this and magic that. And, uh, and I remember, uh, we, we did a show in, uh, Atlanta, Georgia. And then we, the next show was in, um, New Orleans. And uh, I remember that in New Orleans, I, I saw a lot of people with these magic bags a lot of american indians uh you know carry these bags that have uh, fetishes in them little pieces of their life and they keep it in this bag around their neck and uh, spiritually you know so i love that and i remember telling my wife cindy that uh, uh i just i would like to I would like to find one that <laughs> If, if it, someone big was using it, yeah, I'd, I'd probably pay top dollar to have one. Mm. But she happened to find one for me. And um, when I got back to Austin after the break with my mojo bag, I, I mean, I, I was on the plane on the way. I just clicked. I just started doing research on, on the plane real quick about what mojo is and the magic and the black magic and all all that stuff. It's not all bad stuff. There's good stuff too. <laughs> uh, and so I started writing down a couple things about you know feeding off energy and and things that people have. Everybody has something that makes them feel good when they have it with them, on them or with them. Even if it's your little dog, like I got one over here, T-bone, but. Uh, so when I got to back to the hotel, we had a couple of days before we were going back in the studio, and I had this little Foster four track uh, in my room, and I kind of wrote the song. It's like uh, what it was about, and I still have that copy, and it's uh, I did kind of the original copy of that song on uh, Still Moon CD. Uh, it's just called Mojo on there, but I thought, you know, I'm gonna, I'm just gonna bring this in the studio and see what everybody thinks about it. You know, we already picked our songs. Mm -hmm. I mean, Don Grish and everybody's picked the songs for the record, and Gary happens to come in with the stupid Mojo song. What are we gonna do with it? So David thought it was good enough to send back to uh, Drive and uh, Don, and and uh, they just said, well this has got to be on the record. And I think we're going to have to title it, uh, something mojo, you know, feeding off the mojo, which is a line in the song. So that's how that, that record got the name, <laughs> that stupid song, you know, anyway, no, I was pretty, I was pretty honored when I you know, put that together and everybody liked it too. So that's good. Now, during this time, who were you closer to? Were you closer to Brad or were you closer to Kelly or was it, you know, were you guys all three pretty tight? Yeah, I, I felt like a brother to 
to Brad because we ended up spending a lot of time together, you know, <clears throat> writing and uh, coming up with ideas for songs and stuff. Uh, and Kelly was great. I mean, he, he lived in Burbank. California, which is pretty close to where I lived, and so I would go over to his place in his garage, and um, and we come up with some great lyrics for some of the songs that's on the record too. Um, so I I I felt like we we're brothers. Mm -hmm. I, mean, I I felt I felt like uh, when we either played or when we were sitting together, I felt like a like if I can imagine the Beatles sitting around a coffee house, you know, looking at girls or, <laughs> or just thinking yeah. one of these days I'm going to be dreaming. huge, just dreaming. Yeah. And we always felt the same way. I was like, uh, this is meant to be. And I felt that way even to this day. I mean, I love Kelly and everything he does and, and Brad, I mean, he can't do anything wrong. <laughs> um, and, uh, well, we and think just, that, but we're biased. And I'm I'm just old this pig farmer from Ohio <laughs> who decided to uh, go into rock and roll business. <laughs> hey, I have a que I have a question. Yeah, you know back when now, well, back when you were in Night Ranger, there was no internet. You know there was um, Fragilina, there was who was um, Ben Benifer, Ben Affleck, and Jennifer Lopez. The only thing that was a, a connected name at the time was Van Hagar. <laughs> when were you aware of Night Ranger? Be I mean, us fans were all calling it Moon Ranger, and, and yes. there was no internet, and I don't know how it just seemed like that's what everybody was calling it. Well, were because... you aware of that at the time? And did it bother you? <laughs> it didn't bother him a bit. <laughs> <laughs> well, I just know that that Night Ranger was a pretty strong entity they had a bunch of hits uh they weren't going to go anywhere right I mean, whether i was in the band or not i mean they were gonna, and they are i mean they're doing a new record now and they're uh doing shows which is great um and i think what they it was meant to be said like those were the moon ranger days that's when moon was in ranger kind of thing and you know moon ranger you know get on the moon and Ranger Dan and his spaceship. <laughs> uh, and I was, anyway, <laughs> anyway, I was, it was, um, it didn't bother me. As a matter of fact, I, I took it as a badge of honor. Sure. Uh, yeah. Moon, Moon Ranger days. Cause I, you know, those guys worked really hard getting where they were with all those hits since 1982, I think it was, mm -hmm. or yeah. 81, something like that. Yeah. Um, you know, they, clawed their way up to the top and I respect that so much that I was so lucky to become a part of that that uh, when someone says the Moon Ranger days I totally understand because but we were calling that calling it that at present time back then you know oh did you guys start that <laughs> no, no we no. just started it just seemed like everybody hey, had, yes we did we, we uh, well, yeah, I mean, it was, take credit Josh for it, started it. Even back then, yeah, you know, all the right. fans were just, we were all calling it, you know, Moon Ranger even at, at the present time. And it just seemed like everybody was, it just, after the internet came out, it just seemed like, wow, there's other people who were calling it that. Well, you know, it was a, a know, small period of it's time. pretty cool. You know, they, they, they broke up to, to free themselves from what they were dealing with, the uh, label and everything. And we came back fresh. And I think I think it was just like it kind of steered people want to know why was a Moon Ranger? Oh, there's this guy Moon, and we're <laughs> we're the other guys. It's just a power trio, you know. Well, so it's just one of those kind of things that I, I didn't mind. I mean, having my name Moon Ranger. I mean, I'm not going to complain about that. Yeah. But uh, but it's it's always been the Moon Ranger days for me, and and uh, I. To this day, I still feel very privileged to have uh, been in the band and uh, toured, did that record. I mean, it's been, you know, I got to say, I've, I've had a pretty good career for for yeah. not being a, you know, a billionaire. Um, 
drummer for the band Keel. Are you familiar with the rock band Keel from the 80s? Isn't that the guy's name, Keel? Yeah, Ron Keel. The drummer, yeah. Dwayne Miller, he and I were speaking one night, and Night Ranger came up, and he was talking about Kelly Keggy. And one of the biggest compliments he had to give about Night Ranger is when he saw you guys as a three-piece in a club. And he had said, did you ever see that that stage of Night Ranger? Well, yeah, because that was the hardest working three guys I've ever seen in my life on one stage. <laughs> and I thought that was a hell of a compliment. Well, yeah, I mean, I mean, Brad and I were, I mean, when, when we set up, well, you've seen our show, but. Yeah. And we had like two stacks of marshals, one on each side of the stage, one over by Kelly always played on the stage left. Mm -hmm. And Brad and I were over here. So we had all kinds of room on stage, no matter what stage it was. And, and we were wireless. So, and then we finally got the, the head mics when they first started being popular. So we didn't have to be in front of a microphone, even though I, I really loved that working that mic, you know, getting on the side of it and stuff like yeah. that. But uh, yeah, we we were all over the place, and Brad can go anywhere on the stage and hear himself blasting through the side fills and the two Marshall stacks, and I just had just some small little bass amps, over there. <laughs> but I had I had the uh, monitors screaming my bass stuff. So anyway, yeah, that was a lot of fun. So we're gonna. I'm gonna ask some real deep Night Ranger nerd questions. Uh, uh oh. So, so out of the songs like "Your Eyes Are the Window," "Never Say Die," "Love Ain't Pretty," "Alligator," "Heart of Stone," "Wrong Again," stuff like that. Out of those songs, which is a song that you wish would have been included on the Mojo record? Is there a song out of them that you know you were really connected to and were, you know, kind of pushing that didn't make it on? Well, um, you know, a lot of those songs were on the Alligator record. Your Eyes Are the Window mm -hmm. was on Alligator. Uh, and Brad and I kind of came up with that song. It was like the hardest song I think we ever did. I mean, Brad pulled out all the stops on this guitar playing. I mean, I, th <laughs> I think it was guitar Got, uh, had to go on vacation after that recording. <laughs> uh, but, uh, you know, I get really personal involved with the song. So um, I can find something really good out of any song, mm -hmm. uh, especially now. I try to appreciate everybody's music out there. Uh, I never down talk anybody because there's got to be something in that song that artist did to record that song that meant something to them. I don't think these, these people are just, are just, uh, everyday recording artists that have a nice wig on and, a, and they look great and, uh, and their shorts and, and they just, uh, they don't really care about the song. I think as long as it's like banging and, uh, and the sound is like a wall of, you know, uh, there's got to be something in there that made them write that song that ended up being manipulated by the record company or the producer or could be the drummer. I don't know, but, um, I, it's hard for me to pick a song, man. I All mean, right. I, eyes of the window. I mean, I still tell stories about that just about everywhere I go because someone will mention it to me and I go, I even use it in my everyday speaking to people about, you know, your eye, because everybody's wearing masks now, right? You know, you have to know how to read eyes, see what they're thinking. So I'm always saying, you know, I don't mind seeing your mouth talking because I could, your eyes are the window to your soul and I know how to figure you out. And they go, ooh, I better move on to this <laughs> next guy. It's true, next. though. I, I always tell my kids that the eyes never lie. You could yeah. tell by the eyes. I think... I think it's probably the most important part of your your being is because uh, that's what you receive and you give because what you're seeing you're going to react to and, and your your mind and your soul is going to react to what you saw in your eyes. Now, if you're blind, then your your hearing is heightened, mm -hmm. uh, more sensitive, and you have to kind of change up a little bit. But I think the eyes 
say everything. I mean, when you see in a bloodshot eye, they probably had the best time of their life the night before. <laughs> That's Brent. Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> now, another uh, uh, question is, why why the decision to uh, include a cover on Mojo with uh, uh, Do You Feel Like... Do you feel like we do? Was that the company or was that more something on your end? Yeah, that was pretty much, uh, it might've been a John Grierson idea. It wasn't our idea. I mean, I know we looked at each other and said, I mean, we love those songs, Mm -hmm. but if, if we had to put that together and make it our own, put those together as one song, uh, and, it would help the, the the record be played or listened to uh, if they're Beatles fans. Yep. And yeah, uh, let's do it. What the hell? We'll we'll make it our own. And that's what we did. We made it our own. And there was another song that I can't remember who the writer was. Night has a way. Mm-hmm. Uh, that was another song that Drive Entertainment found. I don't know. If, I think it may have been Don Grissom too. They talked us into putting that on the record too because they thought okay we got all the bases covered now you know we got the raw new stuff from night ranger we got a, a great old song from the beatles and peter frampton peter frampton and then uh you know it just makes it more interesting record there's nothing worse than buying a record even though you might have seen an artist live and of course, live, you're getting all kinds of different components. You just see them live, you see their emotions and how they move and all that kind of stuff. And when you buy a CD and all the songs kind of sound similar, you know, I can't tell if that's the third or sixth track. I don't know. Um, but every song on this record sounds so different from the other that uh, those two songs right there definitely put that in play. You know, Night Has a Way and, and uh, you know, so. Mm-hmm. All um, right. Yeah, I, was, I can't answer the. I can't answer your question. Well, I'm I'm glad you guys put the Beatles track on the end. That that to me, that's not probably that's probably my least favorite track on the album. But I liked at least you guys put the Beatles track on there and changed it up a little bit. I like how it morphs into uh, tomorrow. Was it tomorrow never knows? Um, right. What can you tell us about the uh, the album cover that was designed by Sean McManus? Uh, did you guys have some say in that, or what's the story behind them going with the that album cover? Well, I think it was Marvel Comics. Uh, you had to do research on that, but I think they wanted to... The whole idea for the cover was because the group broke up or disbanded for a while, I guess you could say. Uh and there's a great story behind how Night Ranger got their name, what Night Ranger is, you know? I mean, it's a cool name, but there is a great story behind it. There was a guy in San Francisco, um, this, this old fellow that uh, he had a bunch of money. And, and uh, there was, as we know, in all the big cities, especially San Francisco, there's a lot of homeless people, you know, just wandering the streets. And... Uh, so this guy, who eventually was called Night Ranger, you uh, would go around and give them money, food, or maybe shelter. So he became the ranger of uh, the night and helped people that needed guidance or just to survive. So since that was the case, they wanted a, to put a, a character, I'm looking at the album cover right now, a character that kind of looks like me. So if you yeah. Have blonde, right? uh, and then I'm shooting out Mojo, you know, it says sparks are coming out and I'm on in front of a moon, you know? So uh, we wanted to make it look like this guy could be a, a ranger in the 1700s or something like that. I don't know. But that's that. Marvel just came up with that. They knew the story, and they they tried to find as much information as they could to inspire them to do come up with something. 
and I don't know if they came up with more than this, but when we saw it, I mean, I loved it, of course. I mean, I, I'm wearing hats all the time. Yeah, were you already wearing that kind of hat when the, when the art was developed? Yeah, yeah. I was always wearing So it's just coincidence. It's coincidence. Wow. I, I think it was subliminally you were trying to call back moon sparks. Yeah. <laughs> you yeah. know, just I'm just sparks out. Yeah, I get just it. put it out there. The moon yeah. sparks. They're like these guys are mine. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Anyway, it was. Uh, I think it was a great cover. I like the idea of, of uh, kind of comic uh, illustration instead of being so serious. You know, um, just makes you want to think. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if you ever heard that before, but I know it's Gomer Pyle. He used to. <laughs> what are you doing under underneath that bucket on your head, Gomer? Well, I just wanted to get under and make me think. Golly! <laughs> yeah, exactly. But uh, anyway, that's so, that story. So, ninety-five, you guys are touring pretty strong because I saw you in, I saw you in July, early July, in Columbus, Ohio. At the Newport Music Hall, and then I saw you a couple of days later, Tangiers and Akron. I know you two saw them at the whatever the Coyotes. Coyotes. And Coyotes. And that was Drawbridge in Northern Kentucky. That was at that was July as well. I remember one of you guys showing me your your ticket stub. Yeah, I have it. Um, so we all so we played it. We played an N. Well, it was <laughs> um, it was a bar behind the N, like. It was underneath the end, behind in the back, and it was a huge, gigantic bar. And behind you, there there was a big moon uh, on the wall. Am I right, Andy? Yeah, I'm trying to find some of the pictures I can show him while he's talking. Yeah, I mean, you, you had to go. Okay, this is my place because it had the moon behind you already. <laughs> um, but yeah, it was a gigantic bar, and. They started bringing in national acts out of nowhere, you know, when the Lover Boys started trying, trying to come back, and, and, and you know, you guys there. were there, and a bunch, bunch of bands. Mm-hmm. It was a hot spot for about two years, and then it just closed up. I'll put up, uh, if you can kind of see. There's the moon, yeah. <laughs> that's that's yeah. them, and then I've got, you know. Okay. That doesn't yep. ring there's a bell a, at all. Hang on, yeah. there's a picture well, of Gary I'm, Moon I'm, with the moon in his back. You know, so. it was, the moon thing is became crazy big. I mean, did you make up that name? That's not your name, real name, is it? I said, yes. My dad had it, and his dad had it, and so on and so on. And I just told told people, I said, what was I? What was I going to do? Uh, you my it? parents always wanted me to be a doctor, like a proctologist. What a great <laughs> proctologist moon. name. Dr. Moon coming in to look at your butt. Um, <laughs> That'd be the best. Yeah, yeah so. With, with, hopefully, you didn't have poor death perception, you know? <laughs> Ooh. So, um, anyway, you know, I, I didn't know what I was going to do with it, but, you know, Keith Moon was, was like one of my favorite musicians of all yeah. time. Mm-hmm. Um, and I kept trying to find any way I could to see if I was a descendant somewhere, <laughs> a real cousin four times back or something like that and I hope I had some of his talent you know that's coming out of me do you break a lot of things (laughs) yeah I I did there you go you take horse tranquilizers in your spare time yeah (laughs) Um, (laughs) Yeah. so I so I like I said I saw you at the Newport uh, which is it's still in business it's one of the longest running music halls everybody's played there i saw you at the place called the tangiers in akron which if anybody listening to this has been there it's a really unique place in akron it's like a it's like a 1960s 70s vegas cabaret uh it's got the old showroom seating at the dinner tables and the waitress and it's and it's still to this day is is there and uh i still go see acts and stuff there uh and then the album's released in october of 95 uh October 15th 
I never say the dates because they always seem like they're wrong. Uh, yeah, uh, it, it was the day before my birthday. It said so. I, I I'm going with it. So uh, now we'll we'll send you a present now. Oh yeah. And I'm gonna I'm gonna hold you to that. And definitely a sign of the times was was there's no internet. I didn't know the album was coming out till I was at a store and it's there and it's like holy shit, new Night Ranger. Uh, so I got mine in Columbus, Ohio. And then you guys were again doing a winter tour. Uh, I saw you at the Al Rosa Villa in this early December of of 1995. And then you guys were playing again in Akron at another rock club. It was not Tangiers. I saw no. you. I went up and saw you guys. And Brad actually gave us all access passes. And you guys were playing there two nights later. I think you guys were heading to Connecticut and playing then playing there again on the way back. So I saw you guys a couple times there in the late uh, in late ninety five. And as far as I know, with much of stuff I've dug around for the last twenty five years, the last Night Ranger show of the Mojo era was in early April of nineteen ninety six. I do have, I forget who posted it, but I do have a picture of the t- ticket stub, and it does say Feeding Off the Mojo. And uh, so early April of 96 is when the last show was played. And it's middle of June. Night Ranger is back with the original original members getting ready to do a reunion tour. How did that how did that breakup come about of the Mojo lineup? Well, because you guys were doing really good. You, uh, the music scene was changing. I mean, for so much of that Mojo era, it was grunge. And finally you start getting groups like the Eagles coming back. And that's, that was the deal. That was the time when they were putting original members trying to put them back together because I think, you know, most of those bands that we're talking about have huge fans. Mm -hmm. And if you put the original guys back together, that's like the best thing ever. If you're a fan, I mean, you know, a new guy coming in, is not as exciting. I I have to, I had to work, I had to work at it to get people to like me because, uh, you know, Jack wasn't on stage. Now I, I love Jack. I mean, we're friends, so. Uh, but without Jack, they, they didn't think it was Night Ranger. That's when the Moon Ranger thing started coming in. But um, you know, it was, there was an opportunity. One of their old producers, who worked with them before, um, said, I, "I would do a record with Night Ranger again if you get all the original members back together." So. They made him a great offer. Trust me, it was it was a good enough offer for them to to say, uh, "Yeah, we'll do it." So I was disappointed, but I I totally understand the industry, just like with Matt Sorum going with, you know, Guns N' Roses. Um, you know, when you have an opportunity, sometimes you can't let it pass pass by, and to get together with a nice chunk of dough and and get together it could be a, a fun thing you know for them to do that so that's what they did and i just said you know what that's that's cool man i'm just gonna go do a solo record or something so that's what i did you know so yeah. i'm glad i can't i'm glad i i got this record right here um on with brad and kelly because I think there's some really great songs with some deep meaning. There's a lot of inside information in these songs that uh, reflected off our our you know energy together. So, so I'm I'm lucky, lucky guy. And the thing about it is, I think everyone who's there's a lot of people whose first time seeing you guys was during that era and it was, and also 
the fans who were around in the 80s, a lot of them saw you guys during that time as well, um, just like Brent and Andy. And, yeah, we'd been to every tour up until that, so we, you know, we weren't going to mess it. Yeah, we had to go. Yeah, and nothing but <laughs> and nothing but great stories have come from that era. Uh, you know, it's just a shame that you guys worked so hard for five years during the worst time for that music. I mean, through the grunge, through, through the, grunge. the grunge, and you you were just there was light at the end of the tunnel because you guys were starting to get casino deals and stuff like that. You know, which were you know, good paying gigs. And all of a sudden, yeah. you know, there's light at the end of the tunnel. Kiss was getting back together in 96. Uh, it wasn't too long after that rat and Cinderella, all these groups started getting back together and, and poison. Uh, yep. Uh, warrant all, all of them coming back. But the good thing is about that, that era is number one, it produced a good album and it produced great shows. Um, it's, you know, there's sometimes when these bands reform and get different members, um, it's not sometimes up to par. So I think that's one thing that, you know, us Night Ranger fans are appreciative of is you did, you know, create, you know, the live shows were awesome with you. And Mojo was a, was a, you know, an album that stands right alongside any, um, other Night Ranger albums. So, what? I don't know how much you want to talk about this. So uh -oh. you got so you're a third owner of the Night Ranger name and all of a sudden now they are taking that name and getting back with original members. Uh was it something that you guys came to an agreement to? Did you was there anything that you filed, you know, court wise, or was it just something you kind of just let go? No, I had to let it all go. I mean, it's, it's it's not good energy and karma. People believe in that uh, to just stand in a way and just be a butthead and uh, not let you know Night Ranger move go on. I mean, they were so great. Just get back together because uh, you know I don't think I never I don't think I ever signed a contract being a third owner of the name. I don't think I was that, but I was a third equal member of the band. That's kind of the, the wordage on that. Uh, there was never, I never had a contract that I'm one third Night Ranger owner. No. Mm -hmm. uh, anything like that. I mean, those guys were the Night Ranger and I, I just came in and we had the time of our lives did a record and uh, but it was nice when I when we sit down with the camel and uh, when they interviewed me and asked me if I was interested in doing this um, they wanted to give me equal share like the songs were written by Night Ranger well see I was in that mix there was never really a I don't think there's anything mentioned on all the songs in the booklet that comes with right. it that uh you know me and brad wrote this song brad and kelly wrote that song gary wrote this song all by himself uh, because i gave up a lot of songs for equal share last chance um try it for good reason uh music box longest days those are the songs that i brought into the band um but i equally shared that mm -hmm. with everybody in it's Like I said before, I, I, I don't believe in, uh, you know, 20% here and 15% for that guy. And he's yeah. 60 because he's bigger than us, you know? So, um, you gotta keep it equal, man. Because uh, when you're on stage and you're, and you're loving what you're doing with the guys that you're playing with, you know, you want to be equal. So yeah, I agree that's my that. philosophy. Yeah. So the next thing that kind of comes along, you know, music wise that we, you know, that we get on CD is you and Brad work together on his solo album that comes out in 2000 called Alligator based off a Mojo era song. And a lot of there's a Alligator, Your Eyes Are the Window. Um, I thought there was another one as well, but uh 
but those two songs were mojo era um songs and then you sing on the majority of the album was that you know how was it reconnecting with brad brad back then you guys remained close or you know or was it did you guys kind of yeah in the late 90s at that time yeah that time well we had uh, been working on a song because we, for some reason, when you're playing in the South, you know, from New Orleans to Georgia and Mississippi and uh, and all that, uh, you know, I just it's it kind of like Mojo with with the Mojo magic bag, you know, mm-hmm. the spiritual bag. Um, it just it was kind of fun. I to crawl in the dark around midnight, you know, and find your heart and take a big bite, you know. So we just did an alligator thing or a crocodile thing because we were being influenced by the southern part of the United States at that time touring. So we kind of started working on that song together. And that's what sparked uh, Brad to wanting to do a solo record. And, and if I was interested, and I said, hell yeah. So what he would do is he would uh, kind of do that still to this day. He'll, he'll uh, record like a guitar lick and, and uh, a progression, the way he plays. and Something to spark me to write some lyrics down and get an idea for a song. Sometimes he'll have the title of the song and, and a lick. And then so what I would do is I'd do the best I could to come to something together. Then I'd fly up to his studio uh, for three or four days, just lay stuff down, go back home, same thing, send me some more stuff. And I went back up there. And so that's that's, that's how the uh, alligator song, I remember taking a break during the studio and I said, hey, you know, I'm going to go down and have a beer. And I'd go down to some of the bars that were close by and just sit and have a beer. And on a napkin, I'd start writing ideas for a song that we've been trying to come up with lyrics and an idea for a song. And so it, it was spontaneous, but uh, there was a lot of love that, that went into putting that record together. So, yeah. And it was great hearing, you know, some of those old Mojo songs as well, because one of the songs I just always remember that stood out when I saw you in 93 was the alligator track. And it was great to see you guys, bring that song back and then welcome back uh, hopefully you guys enjoyed part two of the gary moon interview um, we have part three getting ready to be put together and edited, which is even better than part two. Uh, Brent, any thoughts? What's, what's going on in that head of yours? If you, if you ever watch the Simpsons and you see Homer Simpson look up at his brain and there's something, somebody in there with little gear, that, that's what's going on in my head. <laughs> now it was really cool. You know, I, like I said, I, I saw them back in this time period. I never, knew that much about Gary Moon. I, I never did that much research. I just knew about him. But to hear the stories that he tells are pretty damn cool. Yeah, and they it's interesting just to hear how dedicated um, Brad and Kelly were to this, you know, era of the band. Absolutely. Um, and like like we've said before, I think, and even in the previous episode was – it really didn't matter who was in the band because they were going up against grunge. Uh, Night Ranger, no matter who was in it, was going to have a tough task no matter what between 1991 and 1995. Um, Uh, Even Damn Yankees was having a hard time during the Don't Tread, you know. Well, yeah, and I think what helped Damn Yankees was they had a new name, 
it didn't it didn't have everything that was attached to the Night Ranger name. And you get some instant credibility when you have Ted Nugent. Yeah. Um there. But the crowd the crowd had the crowds had dropped off a lot more than they were for the first album. Oh, definitely. Um I mean that was even with Poison opening on the Native, Native Tongue tour. Well, that was even later. That was when they first kicked off the Don't Tread tour. You were talking about basically Jackal and Slaughter, yeah, opening for them. And it I saw was, Jackal with them. It was they were playing about three, four thousand seaters, which isn't bad for late nineteen ninety two. Uh, it's still in the beginnings of grunge, mm-hmm. but uh, but yeah, I mean you can't. You, it's the songs have to be good. So there's where your Tommy Shaw and your Jack Blades come in. But you can't go wrong with having that Ted Nugent brand in there no. as well. And I mean, they put a, together a good tour. Uh, Slaughter was still, you know, had some credibility and was still. You know, they were newer and had a, a lot of hits for that time period. And Jackal was a great up and coming. Uh, band and so I was lucky enough to see that tour but yeah it doesn't it didn't matter who you were from that time period you were getting smacked around some can I tell you something about Jackal I I I have a bias against Jackal the only reason being is because they used to come to Cincinnati at least twice a month they played this club called Annie's and this is before they were they were signed and Jesse James Dupree would do the Lumberjack song. I mean, he was doing it four years before that album even came out. And every time he did it, he'd get a bar stool from Annie's, and he'd fire up that chainsaw and saw the, the bar stool down, and the bar just smelled like freaking shit from the exhaust of that thing. So therefore, every time that, I'm like, I, I got to go outside. I, I can't. I, I get sick smelling that chainsaw. So therefore, I was never. And plus, he had, they had another song called "What Dirty Little Mine." Uh huh. Yeah. Well, and the yeah. "Dirty Little Mine," did it. They just went through my freaking head. I would have rather heard "Will You Marry Me, Bill" instead of that song. <laughs> well, I always liked the chainsaw smell because it over. <laughs> it, 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 it. I'd rather. Not in the bar. Well, it was better than the other smelling the other two hundred dudes. That were next uh, to me, so it, I was. It all smelled like Aquanet when I was in the bar. So, but uh, until, until then. But that first Jackal album, even to this day, is a. Now it still gets a lot of heavy, heavy rotation. It, on it's the radio. a good album. I actually enjoyed their second their second album, Push Comes to Shove. Now after that, it pretty much and I bought because I enjoyed those albums so much. I probably bought their next three four studio albums mm-hmm. and none of them even came close so eventually really? i just stopped buying them but uh um those first two uh are really uh good records especially the first record i mean just crank it up and you can't go wrong and one of my favorite country songs is on the second record a song called the secret of the bottle so if you're bored and you want to hear a good kind of classic rock and you know Leonard Skinner type rock and song. Uh, go check out "Secret of the Bottle" by Jackal. But uh, Brent, tell everybody where they can find us at. I thought you were going to say "Rock and Roll Me" and "Jackal Me Off." Well, the, <laughs> I had that. What's... I had that shirt. That yeah, tour uh... shirt. And what's crazy is, I would wear that to high school. Oh my and, lord! And no teacher ever said anything to me. But I did wear Rusty Wallace uh, Miller L- Genuine Draft. Well, yeah. it was probably Miller. That was probably still Miller Genuine Draft at the time. Anyways, the black and gold. And I did get in trouble for that because it was a beer sponsor. But uh, the rock and roll me jackal me off. Totally cool. And what's, I got in trouble. I'm sorry. Go ahead. And what's great about that from a marketing view is you they never put the year on there. So you could just print them up, and it went into a new year, and you're not stuck with old merch. Yeah. Rock and roll, and rock, rock, whatever it was, rock me, jack me yeah. off. Timeless, man. It was timeless. It didn't have a year attachment to it. I remember I used to wear my sex wax shirt. My old, you know, Jess McCauley would have one on. 
Mm-hmm. And do you know what sex sex wax is? I don't you know. What, what it, I remember the was that Fast Times or well, something? Yeah, Fast Times. It's surfboard wax, and on the back it has a circular logo. Well, say, I've been using that shit all wrong. Well, yeah, and uh, but it said Mr. Zog's original sex wax, the best for your stick. And I had about four of those shirts I wear at the school, and I got called. I had to bring in sex wax to prove it was surfboard wax. They didn't believe me. Once they believed me, I had no problem wearing a sex wax shirt to school. It was great. <laughs> anyway, I'd, I'd die if my kids wore something like that. But um, where can you find us? Well, first off, you can go to uh, fansinmotion.com. There's a link that will take you to what Spotify, iTunes, uh, and, um, YouTube. What am I missing, Josh? Uh, Stitcher, Audio Mac. Uh, I'm currently trying to get in there, and I think you only listen like the last ten episodes if you go to iTunes and all that stuff. I'm trying to get that corrected. If you want to listen to all the episodes, you can do it on the website or go to YouTube. We always suggest YouTube because in our interviews and all that good stuff, we will throw in photos yeah. and a lot of visual stuff, and you get to see, you know, Andy Crampin, uh, Andy Crampin, and our ugly mugs as well. So. Uh, so yeah, you got all those and the uh, the Facebook page. Yeah. So hit the subscribe button where you are. Leave us a review. Tell your friends. Tell your mom. Tell your dad. Yeah, and if you're if you're probably a Night Ranger fan, your mom and dad are probably in their mid seventies or early eighties. But tell them anyways. Um, it's never too early to turn someone on to Night Ranger. Uh, hey, this is what we're here for. We are here to give people Night Ranger concentrated talk and interviews with whoever we can get a hold of. So do your best to support the page and support us, and we appreciate it. Uh, yep. n- until next week, Gary Moon Part 3. Um, Happy Hanukkah. Oh, yeah, that's what I was going to say. What's that? I never did. Happy Hanukkah, fans in motion. Yeah. <laughs> that was the other thing I had. You know what? When we didn't mention that at the very beginning of the episode, all our Jewish fans in motion fans gone. That's because they looked at us and they say, funny, they don't look Jewish. <laughs> ah, there you go. Space, wow, that was off the cuff, wasn't it? Baseball's reference check. All right. Until next week, my friends, we will. Uh, what was that? Is that the King Cobra? That was for shaping. There you go, shaping. You happy now? Yeah. All right, everyone. Have a good week. We'll see you next week with Gary Moon Part. <laughs>